So welcome everybody to the Rocky Mountain Mathematical Physics Seminar. Today, uh, we have the first speaker of the new year, Florencia Oros Hunziker from the University of Colorado. And she will speak about tensor categories for non-rational Virasoro vertex algebra. Thank you and please go ahead. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm gonna be talking on based, uh, sorry, on joint work with Thomas, Quibo, David, and Jingwei. And uh, we'll start with some motivation. And let's make sure this works, yeah. Our motivation, it's gonna be related to physics. And a minimal model is a two-dimensional conformal field theory in which we have only finally many irreducible modules for the Virasoro algebra. One can show that the symmetry algebra of such 2D conformal field theory always contains at least the Virasoro algebra. And we only get the situation in which there are finally many representations of the Virasoro algebra for very special central charges. We usually call this theories minimal models. And this is what the central charges look like. CPQ where P and Q are co-prime and greater or equal than two. And this is the formula for CPQ. And for instance, the critical Ising model has C central charge, we'll call this C one half, and P and Q are four, three. And many, many physical assumptions that usually one would assume in physics because there's no interest in proving that they hold, but there's a, there's a reason why we should assume they hold and then we can deduce important things for our models. But many of those assumptions have actually been rigorously proved in a mathematical sense, using the theory of vertex operator algebras. And we'll, we'll discuss what these are in a second. Um, for instance, the construction of a tensor category structure, which is something that we would wanna have in such a model, for the minimal model representations was mathematically established thanks to the theory of Lepovsky and Huang. And their theory assumes rationality, which means that there are only finally many representations that are non-isomorphic and some semi-simplicity conditions. Great, so today we're gonna talk about non-rational models for the Virasoro algebra. So we're gonna allow infinitely many representations and we're gonna also allow a lack of semi-simplicity. So logarithmic conformal field theories are exactly field theories in which neither the rationality or the semi-simplicity are there anymore. And there's an interest in statistical models and string theories that need reducible representations that are indecomposable in which L0, which is some component of the Virasoro algebra does not act semi-simply and in which we will usually get an infinite number of representations. In conformal field theories, as I said, we won't have the nice conditions that we had before that allowed us to kind of construct a tensor category with Lepovsky's and Juan's theory. So in this new context, they did, a, they did develop a logarithmic tensor product theory, which is significantly more complex. But what our goal is in this talk is to actually establish a, a structure of tensor category, even in this more pathological case, even in the context of logarithmic conformal field theories in which we will have a Virasoroli algebra but infinitely many non-isomorphic representations and no semi-simplicity for L0. Great, so we will call this irrational Virasoro representations. It turns out that our, our work actually applies to all universal Virasoro algebras. I'll talk about this more, including CPQs, the minimum models. But the, the useful or the important aspect of our work is that it actually applies to irrational Virasoro models. Great, so here's the plan for the talk. We're gonna introduce the Virasoro algebras and its representations, and this will basically involve Lie algebras and modules. We will define vertex operator algebras and the Virasoro vertex algebras and its representations. So Virasoro vertex algebras are an example of VOAs, and they are the example that we will focus on today. Then we're gonna discuss briefly what it is, what this notion for tensor product of vertex algebras is, because it's actually non-trivial. It's not the, the usual tensor product that you would choose if you have two modules for a Lie algebra. It's quite different. And then we will try to discuss how to choose the right category of modules to apply 
the tensor category that was developed by Lipovsky, Huang, and Shang. The three authors grabbed the rational tensor category theory and generalized it to a logarithmic tensor category theory. So I should say they did that work. What we did was check that this theory can actually be applied to the appropriate category of modules for the Beer Zero algebra. Um, our goal is to choose a proper category in which we can apply this theory. And if we have time, I will also show you a particular um, central charge in which we get that the category is not just a tensor category, but it's actually semi-simple and rigid. So it, every module has a dual. Great, so let's start with the Virasoro algebra. The Virasoro algebra is a beautiful Lie algebra that's infinite dimensional. It has these generators and C, where C is central, so it commutes with everyone. And these are the relations that define the Virasoro algebra or the, the bracket. And it is the central extension of the Wheat algebra, which is just the Lie algebra of derivations on the Laurent polynomials. So here's the Wheat algebra. It looks like this, and it has these generators. And we're just going to take bracket by taking the common commutator. And this is what we obtain. And we just apply derivatives whenever we can, and we don't apply them if we can't. So if we do that, we end up with this. And I just regroup things, scalars with scalars. I end up with this. And this is the same as this. So you can see that this first chunk in the Virasoro algebra are the same as the relations of the wheat algebra. And then there's this little weird thing over here that makes it a central extension, right? We put a two cycle here so that the bracket of LN, LM touches on C as long as, as long as N and M are opposite. Yep, great. It has standard representation theory like the algebras, because it has a, a triangular decomposition, we can define Burma modules. Uh, so what we do is fix a triangular decomposition. This is going to be the positive part of the Virasoro algebra. It's just all of the positive LNs in some sense and the central element. And we're just going to grab a one-dimensional vector space. This is what the C1CH means. And this little C and H are just two complex numbers. But this just denotes a one dimensional vector space. And we're going to make it a beer plus module by defining an action of any of these elements over here. So we're going to have ln act by zero when n is positive. We're going to have L0 act diagonally by a scalar h. This is where the two scalars h and c show up. And we're going to have the central element also act by the other scalar c. And the Burma module is just the induced module in which we grab this beer plus module and we extend the action to all of the Virasoro or all of the universal enveloping algebra of the Virasoro algebra. So in some sense, we can think that the negative part of the Virasoro, which is what's not showing up here, acts freely on this space. That's not completely true, right? But that's one way to think about it. So here's what this module looks like. It has a highest weight vector one HC, if I act by L0, I stay at this level, right? Because I just get a scalar times that vector. And then if I act by L1, well, I'm gonna say that I go down one degree. I will define this degree in a second. Then I could get L, L minus one, L minus one, one, or L minus two, one, et cetera. And you may be wondering where is, for instance, L minus one, L minus two, one? But this is just some Poincare Birkhoff beat sort of argument that tells us that we can reorder anyone so that we can rewrite it as a sum of these elements. Yeah. Why? But well, because we're using the the algebra actions in the universal enveloping algebra. So for instance, if you're wondering what is something like this, oops, why is an element like this showing up in my in my representation here? My representation of this representation. Well, note that using the bracket, we can rewrite this in this way. And L11 is zero because of this first action over here. So this can be rewritten in this way. And similarly, if you're wondering where is this element, well, I can just use the bracket to reorder it in this way. And now it's being written as a sum of two things that show up here. Yep. 
So this is pretty standardly theory. Here are generators for this verbal module. And note that we have this grading on M in which each graded component consists of products of this form in which the else are L minus something. We can only have negative else here because we set L0 ox diagonally and Ln with N positive acts like zero. Then we're gonna ask that the sum of this Ji's be N if we are on the nth degree part of M. Great. So this will be for us degree zero, degree one, degree two, degree, degree three. Any questions so far? We're good? Wait, sorry, I have a question. Uh, yeah. I didn't catch what the one HC was. Yes, so it's, I mean, it's a fancy name because it will have another meaning once we move on to vertex algebras, but you can just think of it as a V. Just, it's just one vector that gives me a one dimensional vector space that I make a VIR plus module. And then with that VIR plus module of dimension one, I induce the Verma module. So it's just to indicate that the degree zero space is a one dimensional space. I see. So each, each one of those nodes is like a, a one dimensional vector. It's vector. vector. That's right. That's right. Yes. So like this space is two dimensional. The space is one dimensional. The space is three dimensional. That's right. I this is the basis of the Verma module as a vector space. I see. Thanks. Yeah. Great. Okay. So just like with other Lie algebras, the Vermas are sometimes irreducible. So you can think of SL2C, right? If you think of representations of SL2C, some Vermas are irreducible and some Vermas are reducible. And when the Vermas are reducible, we mod out by the maximal sum module and we get the irreducible module, which for SL2C is finite dimensional. That will not be the case for the VSO algebra, but we have a similar situation and we're gonna define the reducible lowest weight module of central charge C and conformal weight H, just the quotient of the Verma by the maximal sum module that lives inside it if the maximal sum module is non-trivial, yeah? If the maximal sum module is trivial, then the irreducible is gonna be the same as the Verma and J is gonna be just zero. Great. So it would be important for us to be able to distinguish when the irreducible is coming from actually taking quotients with a submodule versus when the irreducible is just the Verma. Okay, great. Let's move on to the vertex algebra board. So we've established like the basic Lie theory of the Biasor algebra. And now let me just tell you what a vertex algebra is. It's a vector space, a distinguished vector that we call the vacuum vector and a linear map that eats an element in V and speeds out at a power series with coefficients and endomorphisms of V that has poles. But it has poles, but it's not so bad. So once you evaluate it in, a, in an element, oh, sorry, before we evaluate it, I should say, we usually write it in this way, which is weird. A sub n is not right next to z to the n, but A sub n is right next to z to the minus n minus one, yeah? The reason why we do this is because we wanna multiply this whole thing by z to the n, take residue and end up with a n. Cool, so as I said, a sub n is an endomorphism of v and there are poles, but they're not so bad. So once I evaluate it in a v, which is just this, we extend it linearly and it means you're evaluating a sub n in v, there are only finally many things that have z to the negative power. This is what this means. This becomes a Laurent series. So a and b is zero for n sufficiently big. Yeah, which literally means once we expand this, there's only gonna be finally many terms that have z to the negative power. So they're opposed, but they're not so bad. Great, and of course, this is not just what a vertex algebra is, but it satisfies a ton of actions. So let me go over them. The first are the vacuum actions. So remember, we have this map Y that eats an element in V and speeds out a power series with coefficients and endomorphisms of V. So for instance, when we eat the vacuum, which was this distinguished vector, 
the power series we get is identity z to the zero plus nothing else. So every other a sub n is zero. Yeah. So when we evaluate y in the vacuum, we get a really nice series. And if we evaluate y in any element and then evaluate that series of endomorphisms in the vacuum, we end up with something that has no poles. And actually, we can recover a by evaluating that and z equals 0. This shows that y is injective. Another important action will be the Jacob identity. So it looks very similar to the Lee algebra Jacob identity. I'm just going to do this, the commutator of yA, yB. I'm using different variables here. And I'm going to compare it with this iterated composition. And this is going to be equal, except there's some correction terms that we won't get um, really into here. But I'm happy to discuss more after, after the talk if anyone is interested. There's some delta corrections here that actually make this Jacobi identity um, true. And you can think of it as the expansion of the same meromorphic function in three different domains. This is what these deltas are doing. I'm happy to talk more about this maybe after the talk. But we want to mix complex analysis with the Lie algebra structure here. And that's what those deltas are doing there. And equivalently, so there are many, many ways in which we can define vertex algebras. What can replace the Jacobi identity by asking that there be a, a linear map from B to B that satisfies that it behaves like taking derivatives. It takes the back into zero and the locality action, which basically says when you take the bracket of YA and YB, you don't get zero. But you get something that's not too bad. Once you multiply it by a large enough power of z minus w, you end up with zero. So you can think of this as this will give us some sort of power series with poles in c equal to w, but they're not so bad. We can fix it with a high enough power of z minus w. Great. OK, so purple and purple are the things that can be exchanged in this definition. And what's a VOA? We're almost there. A VOA is a vertex algebra that, on top of everything we just discussed, has a Z grading such that the dimension of each graded component is finite. And there's some sort of lower boundedness from below. There's an extra special vector that we're going to call the conformal vector, which gives us a representation of the Vera Soro algebra when we expand it in this way. So notice that we didn't expand it in the usual way, but there's a shift. We're thinking of the component Ln as the thing that goes right next to z to the minus n minus 2. And it gives us a representation of the Vera Soro algebra on our VOA. And then c here is just the rational number that we call the central charge of our VOA. And the c grading is actually given by L0, where L0 is defined by this expansion. So L0 acts diagonally on each graded component and actually gives me the degree of V or the weight of V. Cool. We also asked that L minus 1 actually be the same linear transformation that we asked in the previous slide. Great. OK, that's what a VOA is. A VOA is just a vertex algebra together with a Vera Soro representation that gives us a nice C grading. Let's do an example. And this is like the, 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 the start example of today's talk, the Vera Soro vertex operator algebra. Frank Lanjou proved that if you grab the Verma module of central charge C and conformal weight zero, then L minus one one generates a submodule in there. Once you take this quotient, that's a VOA for any central charge. And here's the VOA structure. So this is the Verma that we discussed in the beginning of the class. We're going to kill this and this and this, right? We're going to kill anyone that belongs to the submodule generated by L minus 1, 1. So this people have died, or this vectors have died. And this is M sub C. And it's a VOA with the following structure. This is going to be the vacuum. Hopefully, we all agree there. And this is why we call it 10z or 1ch. 
so let's see what the structure is. This is MC again. The vacuum is going to be just this vector over here. The conformal vector is going to be the first thing that we see that's not in degree zero. T is going to be L minus one because that was one of the actions. There's nothing to choose there. But one could show that if we grab this as a conformal weight, then this will give us a, a reasonable representation of the periodic algebra. And we have to define y. And the first thing we do is define y here. I didn't define y on this vector because the action said y of the vacuum has to be the identity. So I actually don't have to worry about y on the vacuum. Yeah. The first y that I have to define is y here. OK, and I define it as just this power series of LNs. And I call this field LZ. And there's a theorem, an important theorem, that's generating fields for VOAs that says you can actually generalize this y to some order product of derivatives of LZ. And if you've never seen ordered products before, think about it as a way to reorder things so that they converge, basically. It forces all of the LNs that are N positive to the right so that they will kill the vacuum and all of the generating LNs with a negative to the left. So it's an artificial technical definition to make sure that we're not summing things that diverge, to make sure that we actually end up with things that have coefficients that exist. Great. So this is the, the VOA structure on the Virasoro vertex algebra. And C, which was the Verma mod out by the submodule generated by L minus one. Great. What is a module for a VOA? It's just as a graded space. For us, it would be a Z graded space together with another linear map that goes from B on to power series with endomorphic coefficients and the morphisms of W. We write them in the same way. And again, they have poles, but they're not so bad. Once you evaluate it in a W, you end up with finally many negative powers of Z and it satisfies everything that it can satisfy that was true in the VOA should be true in the module. So it sends the vacuum to the identity. L minus one behaves like derivatives. There's a Jacobi identity in which we take the commutator of YW and compare it to the iterated composition of YW and Y, where this Y is the Y of the vertex algebra and not the module. And again, we need some deltas to make this Jacob identity true. And then we're also going to ask that there be a representation of the Virasoro algebra inside our module with the same central charge as the one that came with our VOA. So this number C has to be the same number that the VOA had showing up when we decompose the Virasoro algebra variable. Great. We're also going to ask that each graded component be an eigenspace for L0 with eigenvalue n, and that the dimension of each of these graded components be finite and lower bounded. Yeah, We can actually relax this definition a little bit. We drop the last condition, and we replace the second to last by generalized eigenspaces. And then we're talking about generalized B modules instead of B modules. Great. So now we have, we know what BOAs are. We know what modules for VOAs are, and they are definitely related to Lie algebras and Lie algebras modules, but they're not the same. So what are the modules for our Virasoro vertex operator algebra? Well, they're my modules. So now once H is not zero anymore, this is what MCH looks like. And I claim that this is a module for this VOA. And the structure is pretty clear. We are just going to build this Y by just jamming a bunch of um, Virasoro generators in there. And we have an action of LN on W. So we can actually use verbal modules to build the um, modules for the VOA. Great. Okay, so we have an example of a vertex operator algebra, which is the Virasoro vertex operator algebra, and a ton of its representations. Cool. Once we start working with vertex algebras, Zhu realized that there was a way to associate an associative algebra to a VOA 
that can tell us a lot about its representation theory. So actually, um, je defined the Zhu algebra of a VOA as some quotient of V. It's a bit technical, so like we want um, focus too much on that, but OV is just the linear span of elements of this form. Doesn't matter too much. We can kind of ignore this formula. But what's important is that once you take the quotient of V by OV, you actually end up with an associative algebra if you define the product to be this. And what's special about this associative algebra is that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence in the appropriate context between the representations of the VOA that are irreducible and the representations of the associative algebra that are irreducible. So a, mat, a, a quite difficult problem, understanding irreducible representations of a VOA translates into a more reasonable problem, understanding irreducibles for an associative algebra. And for the Virasara VOAs, the associative algebra is just the polynomial ring. And there's an associative module. So as I said, for each module for the VOA, there's a module for the associative algebra. So one can imagine that to the Verma, we can associate a module for the associative algebra is just the polynomial ring in two variables. Great. And in particular, these are the isomorphisms. What's important is that because the dual algebra is the polynomial ring, the polynomial ring has infinitely many irreducible representations, right? One for each complex number. So there's actually going to be infinitely many irreducible representations for our Vera Sora VOA. Uh, it's important to know that Zhu algebras act on modules in a compatible way with quotients, meaning when you take the Zhu module of a quotient, it's the same as taking the Zhu module. Sorry, when you take the Zhu module of a module and then quotient out by the image of a submodule, it's the same as taking the Zhu module of the quotient. Yep. Great. So as I mentioned, we can already see that it's not trivial, it's not immediate to study um, the representations of the Virasora VOA because there, there will be infinitely many reducibles. Fortunately, uh, Fagan and Fuchs did a lot of work on the classification of Fermi modules and um, the description of all of the maps between them. So actually they proved that First of all, for any central charge, they give you a list of all the conformal weights H for which MCH is reducible. And they list it. So we're going to call H sub Z all of the H's or the conformal weights, the conformal uh, weights such that MCH is reducible. For example, when the central charge is one, Fagan and Fuchs tell us the only way MCH is reducible is when H looks like this, M squared over four with M an integer. If H is not of this form, then M and L are the same person because M was already irreducible. Okay, and actually they give us partial singular vector formulas. We know that the singular vector, so the vector that generates the proper submodule in the case in which there is a proper submodule, looks like this. And the sum is over N tuples that satisfy this. It doesn't matter too much what the details of this vector, uh, singular vector formula is, but it will matter for us that we know something about the singular vectors. So in general, well, we can say H sub one, when C is one, is the same as M square over four with M and Z. And we actually have this sort of list for any central charge. They actually describe, so once, if a Verma is not irreducible, then it contains an other Verma inside it. And actually any map between two Vermas has to be an injection. So they give embeddings of Verma modules and they look like this when the central charge is less or equal than one and they look like this when the central charge is greater or equal than 25. Cool. So actually the CPQs that we discussed in the beginning of the talk correspond to diagrams of this form. Hey, uh, can I, I uh, ask yeah. a question? Uh, yes. So here, here uh, C can also be negative or not? Absolutely, yes. Oh, it can be negative. Okay. It can, it can. It's allowed to be negative, yes. I see. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the CPQs that we discussed actually correspond to this case. And what happens in that situation is that we killed 
and I'll talk more about this. We kill enough submodules that we only finally many survive. There's a good way to kill enough submodules that finally many survive. Well, when we get chains like this, there isn't a good way to do that. Cool. Okay, so thanks to Fagan and Fuchs, we have a lot of information of the virus on the virus through algebra and its representations. And we know that any map between two germs has to be an embedding. So for instance, let me just give you an example again. When the center charge is one, these are the two possible chains of embeddings. M10 is reducible and M11 sits inside M10. M11 is reducible and M14 sits inside M11. And these two chains don't talk to each other. And that's it. In the slide, obviously there has to be an infinite chain, but in the slide, we've listed all of the Verma modules that are reducible if you fix the central charge C to be one. Everyone else is irreducible. And to get the irreducible, when H looks like M squared by four, you have to grab this verma and mod out by this other verma that sits inside it. Yeah. It's a little more complicated than the case of SL2C, but it's nice that we have a lot of information, basically all of the information that we need to understand who's reducible and who's irreducible. Great. <clears throat> so let's go back to the Virasora word. We said that if the central charge is CPQ of this form, then the minimal models are very nice. And one can show that the irreducible is not the same as our VOA, but there are actually two singular vectors inside this derma. It corresponds to that diagram that had things like this coming out of one uh, vector. So once I mod out by two singular vectors, I end up with a much smaller thing that has only finally many irreducible non-equivalent representations. And in that case, when I look at the dual algebra, I actually end up with a finite dimensional associative algebra, which is a quotient of this polynomial ring. And as I mentioned, it's been established that once you have finally many irreducible representations plus some other conditions, one can build a tensor product structure on the category of representations. We are interested in this, all the other central charges, which are a ton, in which the irreducible VOA is the Verma mod out L minus one one. There's only one singular vector in the sperma, so the Joux algebra actually is just the polynomial ring, meaning there are infinitely many irreducible representations. So as I said, the goal of the talk is to try to figure out whether we can apply the logarithmic tensor product developed by Huang Lipovsky and Shang. And of course, if we choose all of the representations, the answer is no, we can't. We have to, in some way, pick the proper category of representations. And that's what we're gonna try to do in the next part of the talk. So I just wanna briefly mention that the tensor product for VOAs is not straightforward. We won't get into it because it's very technical and already VOAs are technical. So that's enough technical stuff probably for the talk. But if we have, so let's think about the Biasor algebra as a Lie algebra. Just because it's a Lie algebra, we know that if M1 and M2 are Lie algebra modules, then M1 tensor M2 is a Lie algebra module, right? And the action is just this one. We act on the first component tensor the identity plus the identity tensor the action. Note, however, that this will not work for a VOA. Because once we fix the VOA, so we're not thinking of the Lie algebra anymore, we're thinking of MC the central charge becomes 2C, which is not allowed. That means this is not a module for a VOA. Remember when I said, when I was describing the definition of module, I asked that the central charge of the module be the same as that one for the VOA. So this is the first difficulty. You can't just use the Lie algebra to build the tensor product of two modules if you wanna stay in the vertex algebra representation category. So Kashin Linguistic were the first to do work to fix this problem. And then uh, Lebovsky and Huang generalized their work to any VOA and they defined the correct notion, which is that of a PC tensor product. And we won't define it. It was later generalized by Huang, Lebovsky and Zhang for um, less restricted situations. But basically we can think of it as some sort of restricted dual 
to a subspace of the dual of M1 tensor M2 that satisfies certain compatibilities. And this fixes the central charge. It makes the central charge stay C and not go to 2C. Great. So with this slide, what I want to say is the tensor product of modules for a DOA is much more subtle than the tensor product for Lie algebras. Unfortunately, tons of people have done a ton of work to kind of define it um, carefully and make sure that there's an associativity and that the structure is, is a structure of a tensor, of a braided tensor product. Great. So as I mentioned, we want to try to figure out what category we have to choose to apply this theory. So we need this definition. If we have a vertex operator algebra B, we're going to define the positive part to be the positive part. And we're going to define the C1 part of a module to be the linear span of elements of this form in which we're taking minus one product. This minus one product comes from a n zero to the minus n minus one of anyone in W with the minus one product of someone in V plus. So we're interested in things that come from the strictly positive part of P. Great. And we're going to say that the module is C1 cofinite if the dimension of V mod C1W is finite. It sounds like a technical um, condition, and it is, but it's one of the conditions that we need to apply uh, Huang Lepofsky and Shang's tensor product. Great. So let's try to figure out what this would mean in the Vera Soro case. So in the case of the Vera Soro vertex algebra, as long as we fix the central charge to not be a CPQ, we have that the irreducible is isomorphic to our VOA. And therefore, the strictly positive part of this irreducible starts here, continues here, continues here. Yeah, the strictly positive part of this VOA is everyone except the vacuum vector. Do you agree with me? Great. So notice that if omega is this conformal weight vector here, this conformal vector here, then I can write the y of omega in this way. So we have that the minus one product of omega is L minus two, there's this shift that we talked about that makes this field a little confusing, but it's good to know that we can capture L minus two as someone minus one with that someone in the strictly positive part of B, because that tells us that the Burma mod its C1 space is going to look like this. The C1 space is going to be anyone that's L minus two or L minus three or L minus four. Yeah, so we can grab anything that has an, at least an L minus two here. We can't grab anyone that has L minus one because that would not be the minus one product of someone in the positive part of B. So when we take the quotient, all of these people are not in C1, so are not gonna die when we take the quotient. Yeah, which means Vermas are not C1 cofinite because there are infinitely many linearly independent vectors that are in M mod its C1 space. So Vermas are not C1 cofinite. And this is why it, it will be important to throw away irreducibles that were Verma modules. We only want to kind of grab irreducibles that were not Verma modules, but quotients of Verma modules. And let me show you why. So what happens if instead of a Verma module, I grab a Verma that's not irreducible, so it has a singular vector. And as I mentioned before, Fagin and Fuchs actually proved that the singular vector looks like this. It doesn't matter too much what it is, but what's cool is that it's L minus one to some big power plus a sum of things that has L minus two or L minus three or L minus four. What this means is that this, if I grab the Verma and I kill the submodule generated by the singular vector, whatever that is, I don't know what the singular vector is. It could be over here, over here. I don't know at what degree it is. I mean, Fagan and Fuchs can tell us, but it's not clear in principle from the drawing. Then 
This part is in C1 of MCH because it has an L minus two or an L minus three or an L minus four or, or two L minus twos. It has one of these Ls is not an L minus one. If we take quotient by the singular vector to get the irreducible, well, this, we take the irreducible mod its C1 space, taking C1 space is also compatible with taking quotients, it will be the same as this. So now if we kill this vector, then that becomes a member of C1 as well. So once we take quotient, we'll see that this is this minus this, and therefore in C1. So when we take L mod its C1 space, we end up with finally many linearly independent vectors. So what does this mean? Well, irreducible modules that are not Burmas are C1 finite. So it's gonna be really important for us to throw away Burmas and to kind of rescue irreducibles that are not Burmas. Great, so thanks to Fagan and Fuchs, we know that any lowest weight MC module is C1 cofinite if and only if it's not isomorphic to a Burma module. We also know that a C1 cofinite lowest weight module has finite length, and that the compositions of a C1 cofinite lowest weight MC module look like this, where H is one of those conformal weights for which this is not a Burma. Great. So we're in good conditions to try to build our category. In, um, this, all of these statements are non-trivial and they follow from the fact that we have a lot of information, thanks to Fagan and Fuchs, on the structure of Burma modules and the embeddings between them. So we're gonna define two categories. The first one is gonna be OC finite, the category of finite length generalized MC modules. I'm talking about vertex algebra modules with composition factors that are isomorphic to irreducibles non-Burmas. We're gonna define another category, C1CL, which is the category of lower bounded C1 cofinite generalized MC modules. And let me tell you why I'm, I'm doing this. Why am I defining two categories? Marcus, sorry. Yeah. Oh, oh, did yeah. you have a question? Sorry. No, no, I'm fine. Oh, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> gotcha. So I'm defining two categories. The first one is very nice because it's closed and they're taking some modules, direct sums, quotients, and duals. All necessary ingredients for my tensor category. The second one is very nice because it's closed under this PC tensor product notion. So what we did was prove that these categories are the same, which will mean we have all of the ingredients. We have the closeness under tensor product, and we have all of the ingredients needed for this tensor product to work. So we proved that they're the same. And here's the proof. Maybe I'll give you a sketch of the proof. One of the inclusions is actually pretty straightforward. So if we grab a finite length module with non-Berma irreducibles of composition factors, then we can show that it's C1. We have this resolution of the module. And we have that each subsequent quotient, it's an LCHI. But then I showed you that irreducibles that are non burmas are C1 cofinite. So we can lift, oops, I'm sorry. We can lift C1 cofinite-ness and show that everyone here is C1 cofinite and therefore W is C1 cofinite. So this inclusion is pretty straightforward. The other inclusion is a little, um, takes a little more work. So if we grab a lower bounded C1 cofinite module, generalized module, then what we do is the following. We're gonna build some sort of lowest weight module inside it by grabbing the smallest eigenvalue for L0 with the eigenvector in W, but not in its C1 space. And remember, our assumption is that W is C1 cofinite. So if we were to do this many, many times, we would end, we would end the process in a finite number of steps. Because W is lower bounded, L and W cannot have smaller degree than W. So we get the W is a singular vector and that it generates a lowest weight module inside W mod W1, which is also C1 cofinite. We just do this again. We graph a smallest second eigenvalue that satisfies this, where the eigenvector now is here. And we build an other lowest weight module 
after we build the lowest weight module, we lift it to a module in W such that W2 my W1 is this lowest weight module. And we get that this quotient is again in C1. And we just do this n times and we will end because by assumption, there are only finally many vectors, linearly independent vectors in W mod C1 W. So we continue with this process and we end up with a sequence of epimorphisms like this. As I mentioned, we are going to finish in a finite number of steps because W C1 cofinite and each of the subsequent quotients is the lowest weight module. The, the last step occurs when this happens, but one could show that a space is equal to its C1 space if and only if it's zero. So that means that this sequence of epimorphisms can be rewritten as a sequence of injections in which this subsequent quotient is the lowest weight module. It's a lot of work to actually show that this is not just the lowest weight module, but it's a C1 cofinite lowest weight module showing up in this decomposition. But thanks to Fagan and Fuchs, we can actually do that. And then this is how we finish our proof. This sequence of submodules can actually be extended so that each subsequent quotient is one of our irreducibles number mass. And this is how we show that these two categories are the same. And here's our theorem for any central charge, the category of generalized MC modules whose simple composition factors are isomorphic to non-Berma irreducibles has a braided tensor category structure. And in particular, we were able to show that if the central charge is of this form, where T is a non-rational number, then the category of finite lengths MC modules with simple composition factors irreducible number mass is rigid. And maybe because we have a little bit of time, I'll tell you about the proof of the rigidity in this case, uh, maybe without full details. But um, what we did was used some fusion rules. So the first thing we did was show that actually when the center charges of this form with T non-rational, we actually end up with a semi-simple category, which is not the case for most central charges. And Frankel and Zhu, another Zhu, so Frankel, my advisor, and Min Xian Zhu, proved certain fusion rules in this category. So they actually proved that the tensor of two modules, in principle, that the lean tensor product, but thanks to us, because we establish a tensor product structure in the category, this is also the fusion product, looks like this. And Using their fusion products and our result, we were able to actually finish the computation for all fusion rules and show that this holds as well. And um, I will skip some of the slides here because I don't want to get into too much detail, but using the theory of W algebras, we're going to ignore this, in a fine vertex algebra, one can actually build some sort of associative commutative algebra in the direct sum completion of a category and use the rigidity in that category to prove that the simples in our category are rigid. So what we did was prove that simples of this form and simples, just one second, sorry. Okay, yeah, let's ignore that. <laughs> simples of this form and simples of this form are rigid. And then because our category is semi-simple, the fact that all of the simples are rigid, using our fusion rules, we get that all of the simples are rigid or all of the simples have duals that are compatible with the tensor category structure. Plus the, the category is semi-simple, we end up with rigidity for the whole category. So this is how we show that for this central charge, we not only have a braided tensor category structure, but it's a rigid braided tensor category structure. Future work would be to try to prove rigidity for all central charges. So there's already been some progress in, in this sense. So Robert McRae proved that uh, the category with center charge C equal one is rigid by building a construction that uh, shows that the semi-simple, the semi-simplification is equivalent to, uh, to a test to um, representations of SL2. Uh, plus a theorem that says that if the simples are rigid and your category is finite length, then the non-semi-simple category is also rigid. And then Robert McRae and Jingwei, one of my collaborators recently proved rigidity for central charges C1P, which are one of the central charges, but there's still work to be done there for the negative Cs and uh, for the negative Ts, I guess. 
And uh, obviously, the dream is to try to adapt this proof uh, to other VOS. But that is difficult because, as I mentioned many times in the talk, we relied very heavily on the fact that Fagan and Fuchs had studied very thoroughly the, rep the representation theory of the Virasoro algebra. For other VOAs, we do not have such a detailed account of embeddings between Burma's singular vector formulas, et cetera. And I think I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thanks to speaker. So are there questions? Are there questions? It, I have a short question. I mean, actually, uh, it seems that, uh, I mean, I originally come from uh, math physics and uh, uh, did some stuff in algebraic uh, quantum field theory or have been always interested in. And it seems that at the very beginning, uh, when you defined all these concepts, um, these uh, algebras would fit, uh, I mean, there are similarities to what you have in algebraic quantum field theory. Could you maybe please uh, make some comment on this or? <clears throat> so I don't know a lot about um, algebraic quantum field theory, uh, but I can say that VOAs are in some sense, I mean, they have many uses. So every time you have generating functions, you can try to use the theory of VOAs and this has been done to kind of find incredible connections with number theory. Um, characters, right? Characters of the algebras could be related to these. But I would say most importantly, they're fields like in the physics sense. So in a conformal field theory, you actually have an energy tensor operator and that actually corresponds yeah. to the Virasoro operator. And then you have fields and actually fields behave like this fields in, in vertex algebras. So I would say all of these actions that seem insane and a little, um, mm -hmm a little strange, they actually follow some important assumptions, um, minimal assumptions that you would want to get some sort of consistent 2D conformal field theory. And then, and then many of the assumptions that you would actually make in physics have not been made to try to see if they follow from like this set of minimal uh, actions. So maybe, maybe that's what I would say about um, this definition, but I'm sure that there's certainly many surprising uses of vertex algebras in apparently unrelated fields. Mm -hmm. The other connection, I mean, even though I, um, I'm not an expert in this, but there's this whole theory of factorization algebras, which has come up recently. And uh, so this kind of, uh, this, what you talked about kind of looks as it would fit very much, very well in this picture. That's right. Yeah. Okay, further questions? No, then let's thank Floor again. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Okay, let me just.